Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm in my third year at Warwick Medical School. My first degree was in languages, French and Russian, and then I did a master's in translation. I also worked in a hospital for three years as a medical secretary before I started medical school. So I first went to Oxford to do French and Russian and I graduated in 2011. And then after that I moved back to Russia for a year just to brush up on my Russian. Came back and did a master's in translation and at that point started to do medical translation and started to think, mm, this, this medicine, this is all right, this is quite interesting. So I decided at that point that I was going to go into medicine and got a job in a hospital as a secretary just to earn money. Um, but unfortunately I needed to get some surgery and the wait for that took ages. So I ended up working in the hospital for three years, waiting for that to happen before I started medical school in 2017. Um, I think first year for me was in some ways the easiest of all the years. I know that a lot of people find it really hard because there's a lot of book work. You don't really get to see that many patients. You get to see some and more than other medical schools let you see in first year. But there's an awful lot of just lectures and reading and memorising stuff. I think for me, because my first degree was at Oxford where we didn't really have a curriculum, I got on quite well because Warwick made it very clear what they wanted us to know. And so even though there was way too much to learn, like you cannot possibly learn everything that they give you in first year, but they don't expect you to, like the exam pass mark isn't 100%. Um, I got on quite well just because I felt that it was clear what was expected of me. And so I just put my head down and got on with it. Also having had to wait so long to start medical school, I was just really happy to finally be here um, and be getting on with it. And then in second year, I felt a bit more like I was back at undergrad because you have to do a lot more on your own once you start clinical placements. You get a list of learning objectives that you have to try and cover, but it's up to you to figure out how you want to do it. And that carries on into third year. It's just that the level that's expected of you is a bit higher. So I think I did like the fact that there was still a curriculum, so I had some idea. It wasn't always clear how much depth we needed to go into, and I struggled a little bit with that. But on the whole, because you are still going into hospital and you are still seeing supervisors and consultants and teachers that have some idea what level is expected of you, I think I just tried to work as hard as I could and kind of told myself that I'm doing as much as I can. It's got to be enough because I can't do more than this. And it was, it was fine. Um, the exams at the end of second year went really well. Um, there were some things that I felt I should have learned and I didn't, and other things where I thought maybe I went into a bit too much depth. But overall, I think if they were that bothered, they wouldn't let the curriculum be so kind of laissez-faire. Like if it was really strict, then they wouldn't give you so much freedom. Um, so I was relatively comfortable with that. The transition from a non-scientist into a scientist was somewhat cushioned by the fact that I did the GAMSAT. I applied to three GAMSAT universities and Warwick was my only UK cat. Um, so I did have to learn quite a lot of science and because in the run-up to applications I was waiting to have surgery and the surgery affected my wrist so I couldn't really write very well. Uh, trying to learn like three science A-levels when you can't use a pen is quite hardcore um, and that meant I had to get quite creative in my study style. So actually by the time I got here I'd had the surgery, I could use a pen again. Uh, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. I'd done the preparation, I'd also explored lots of different learning styles, um, so I was sort of prepared. But also what really helped was the non-scientist seminars, which had been set up for the first time the year I was here. So the second years who were above us started the whole thing of the non-scientist seminar, and they were really fab teachers and they helped us so much. Um, and they made a really big difference to how well I did in the first year exams, and for the rest of medical school really, because you do lay the foundations of your knowledge in first year. Um, and I think it wasn't until we got into second and third year that it became more of a help to have a humanities background where I'm really comfortable talking to people. And it's obvious when I'm with patients that I'm not freaked out by the concept of interacting with another human being. And having done a lot of acting as well, I'm used to working with people that I don't know very well. I'm used to thinking about how people feel and the effect that your environment and your circumstances have on you. And again, that's actually really helpful. So the science, yes, was hard, but I'd done a lot of prep before I got here and had a lot of help when I was here, so it wasn't so bad. And then the other aspect of having done humanities stuff has become really, really useful into second and third year. Have you managed to, so you said about the acting, have you managed to keep that up when you came to medical school? Yeah, 
I've done quite a lot of acting since I came here. It's just a thing that I need for my sanity. I do most of it on main campus with the undergrads. Um, so in my first year, I did a play that we performed here, and then we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe in the summer of first year, which was a lot of fun. I uh, highly recommend doing something in your summer of first year because it's a really good holiday. Um, we then did that same play in London in Christmas of second year. And then I did a separate play at the Edinburgh Fringe in the summer between second and third year. And I just had to take some leave to do that. Um, we don't really get like a proper holiday in second year, but I just booked the leave and went and that was fine. Um, and then this Christmas just gone, I was in a Shakespeare production of Richard II, um, which we just performed here on campus, but was so much fun and has, it's been so important to do something that is not medicine. I worried I wouldn't have time to do things that aren't medicine when I was here, but I think it honestly pays off in terms of the, just the level of sanity that you get from spending time with people who aren't medics and who talk about things that aren't medicine, allowing to yourself to just be distracted just for a couple of hours a few times a week. And they've been really understanding with the fact that my timetable is quite busy, much busier than the undergrads that I'm working with. Um, so that's worked out really well and I'm so glad that I've been doing it. I think second and third year has been less structured than I thought it would be. That might just be because after first year I assumed that all the rest of it would be like that. First year is very structured and everything is handed to you on a plate and I wasn't really prepared for how different second and third year would be. And maybe I'd just been watching videos kind of on YouTube before I came of people at other universities, particularly American universities, just because it's easier to access that content, who do seem to have a much more structured curriculum. So I guess it was a bit of a culture shock, but as I say, having done a degree somewhere else where there's literally no curriculum, it's just like, here are some books, we'll ask you some questions about them. Uh, see you in eight months, bye. I felt that I can cope with it quite well, but yeah, sometimes when you're not being taught every day or every week and you're just being given learning objectives and sent off into a hospital, it can feel a bit like, why am I, why, why am I at university? I feel like I'm doing this all myself and the university isn't helping me. But I get why they do it, because I think you do learn more um, when you are just thrown in at the deep end. Um, and I guess, I guess if you think about however much you set yourself to learn, you're probably going to fall slightly short of that. Um, so if you set yourself a target of exactly what you need to know, you're probably going to fall slightly short of what you need to know. When you don't really understand what's expected of you, you set your own targets and they are like way further than what you need because you then fall short of those. Where you actually fall is where you need to be. And I think that's why they do it. So yes, it was a bit disappointing and not quite how I'd expected it, but I think I get it and I'm not sure that I would go back and do it differently if I had the choice because the level of knowledge that I have I think is pretty good. Uh, I really want to do emergency medicine because I'm an adrenaline junkie with a short attention span. Um, I haven't done my acute rotation yet, it's the next one that I've got coming and I'm really excited about it. Um, every time that we've done something in an emergency setting as part of another rotation I've just got such a buzz out of it. Um, I find it really focuses the mind. My brain is quite busy most of the time and I think being in an emergency scenario just helps me to focus and kind of gets rid of all the background noise and I find that quite, not calm, but it's sort of, there's something sort of zen about it, you know, and like you're not thinking about any of the crap that doesn't matter, you're just focusing on like how are we going to maintain this airway, how are we going to get this person sat to above 84 or whatever. Um, and I've been to some pre-hospital medicine conferences and done some training scenarios, which are also a lot of fun. Um, there's one that runs at Warwick now that was started by some people in our year. And if you get the chance to do that, I very highly recommend it because it's a lot of fun and it's a great way of finding out how you cope in those scenarios without actually putting anyone at risk. <laughs> um, so that's what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I, as I say, worked as a secretary for three years. And that didn't count on my application as clinical experience. However, if you get the chance to do a job in admin at a hospital, I would actually really recommend it because you learn how the hospital works. And nobody really tells you when you're applying, when you're doing work experience, how much of being a doctor is about understanding how the hospital works and who you have to ask for things and where you need to go, um, how you request tests, who knows what, that kind of thing. So. Yes, you have to do clinical experience being an HCA working with patients, but don't dismiss opportunities that you might get 
to do non-clinical work in a hospital because it is really important. Um, and I'm so glad that I did it. I genuinely think that was much better preparation for being an F1 than any of the shadowing that I did on the wards before I came. Um, I also think if you're coming from a non-science background, check that the uni you're going to has support available for non-scientists because it is a culture shock. And if you can do preparation beforehand, that's great if you have the time. I was lucky in a weird way that my application was delayed by having to wait for surgery because it gave me more time to do science stuff. Um, if you don't have that time, if you don't have that luxury, make sure that where you're going has support um, so that you don't feel completely overwhelmed and you've got other people who could help you out and support you emotionally. I'm a huge fan of Chekhov's plays in Russian. Generally, when I see them in English, the translations are so bad, they make me want to stab my eyes out with a fork. I've seen one good translation. It was by Tom Stoppard, who doesn't even speak Russian. Um, I saw it, I think, at the Donmar Warehouse. And it was, it was really trippy because it was like watching Chekhov. And it sounded like Chekhov, but it wasn't in Russian. And it just freaked me out and made my brain explode. Um, I know a lot of English people hate Chekhov. And frankly, if all you've ever read are the usual translations, I can't blame you because they are awful. But if you can go and see a Tom Stoppard translation, do it, friends, it's worth it. I think my favourite part of the course so far has been any instance where you're in a clinical scenario, you're with a patient, and you can do something helpful. A lot of being a medical student is having to observe, and you just have to be patient with the fact that you're not qualified yet and there are some things that you can't do. And especially if you're like me and you're really into like the high octane scenarios where everything is mad and you just want to get in there, it can be really difficult to have to stand at the end of the bed and just let the experts do their thing. But then when you can um, take a history because the, the doctor doesn't have time or you do an exam and your findings are used and written in the notes or they need blood taken, they need a cannula and you can do it and then you've achieved something, it feels really good and it reminds you why you're here and why you're doing this. And I think it's really important when you're on clinical placements, anytime you can have an opportunity to do anything that makes you happy, you chose medicine, you should do it because it's tough. It's a long road. It's really hard. And you really need that extra motivation that you get from scenarios where you do something, you feel like you've made a difference and you're like, this is what I signed up for. This is why I'm here. And it, and it makes the hard work worth it for want of a less cheesy phrase. I had, for the nerds among you, arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, for which I had a bilateral first rib resection with pec minor tenotomy. Basically, the blood supply to my arms was being cut off uh, because the artery was getting squashed between my top rib and my collarbone, so we had to cut out a piece of the rib to make space for the artery. Before they did that, I was really struggling with a lot of wrist pain, which is not a very common presentation of the condition, and that's why my diagnosis and my treatment took so long to get. Um, and obviously when you're studying, being able to write and make notes is kind of a big deal. It did also really impact just all of my day-to-day -day living, like when things were at their worst, I couldn't cook for myself because I couldn't chop vegetables, I couldn't hold a pan of boiling water, I couldn't order like a large coffee in a cafe because I couldn't lift it as far as my mouth without it hurting. Um, and the medical school were actually really good about accommodating that. So currently, my wrists are much better. I do still get like tendonitis because I'm hypermobile, so I do still have some elements of pain. And I declared that to the medical school when I started. I had to defer my entry um, waiting for the surgery. And now that I'm here, what we generally have to do is just make some exam adjustments. So when I sit my exams, I can have rest breaks if I need them, um, and I can have longer to do the exam because I might not be able to write solidly for three hours without taking a break. Um, and that's been really easy to set up. I just went to the disability service, told them what I needed, and they put it in place. And that was fairly straightforward. Um, the rest of the time, I generally don't need any adjustments making, but I tell the hospitals where I go about it just in case. Because, for example, I might not be able to do CPR, like if I've had a bad day and my wrists are quite painful. Um, there are certain things I might not be able to do. Um, so far, it's not really been an issue. As I say, everyone's been very accommodating. You just tell them what you need. And as long as what you're asking for is reasonable, they will let you do it. And then I just kind of play it by ear, go day to day, seeing what I can do and what I can't do. I can do most things now. So it was definitely worth waiting to get the surgery. I was very tempted to just start medical school anyway and get the surgery halfway through. And I'm glad that I did not do that because first year would have been so much harder if I tried to do it. It, it, with the level of disability that I was at 
pre-operation. Um, so I, I thought it would make life quite difficult, but actually it's not been too bad. I can't speak for anyone else who has had experience of studying with a disability. Everyone's experience will be different, but I found on the whole that if you're upfront with whatever medical school you're at and whatever hospitals you're training at, um, they're quite used to having to deal with occupational health issues and as long as you're open about it, they're generally pretty good. So something else that I mentioned to occupational health at the same time that I was telling them about the surgery and the things to do with my wrists was that I have quite a colourful history of mental health problems and it's been something that has been going on for a really long time with me and so I'm quite used to the impact that it has on my life and how I manage it. When I was about 14, I got depression that was really bad. Um, I struggled with self-harm for a long time. I then developed an eating disorder as a way of coping, which, you know, works at first and then really doesn't, doesn't work at all. Um, and I got treatment for that when I was an undergrad at Oxford. I just got really lucky because I was in the right place at the right time. The treatment team I had in Oxford were fantastic. Um, they literally saved my life. Um, and I know that to this day, I'm really lucky to have had that treatment and the medication that I'm still on is a bit rogue. Pharmacists always get really confused about why I'm on the medication that I'm on because it's not first line or second line or third line or fourth line. It's really unusual, but it works. Um, and so coming into medical school, I do feel that I'm a lot healthier now, but I'm also aware that medical school is really stressful and it's something that you have to be aware of um, that you might slip back. The other thing that I knew might have an impact um, is that I have PTSD and there are certain patients that you think this is this is a, a little bit triggery and I'm not entirely sure I can handle this. And, and I knew that that would be the case. And so my approach was just to be very upfront with the medical school. I told them at the same time that I talked about um, the surgery that I'd had. And I found that as long as you're kind of uh, open and upfront, again, they were they were very good about it. I wasn't really asking for any huge adjustments to be made. I was more just giving them a heads up of like, look, I feel really healthy now, but these are things that I have struggled with in the past and they might crop up again. My personal tutor in first year was really good about checking in and making sure that things were going along well um, and that I wasn't relapsing. And now that I'm doing my psych block as part of third year, like now I'm seeing the patients where I might struggle and it might be a little bit difficult so far, I've been able to manage it, but I'm glad that I let the medical school know in advance. So if, for example, we're in a situation where like, you're talking to a sim patient and they're pretending to have a mental illness that I have struggled with or that I'm just finding it a bit hard, I feel like I can just tap out and be like, I, I don't want to do this station. I don't feel able to. And I warned the medical school in advance and they agreed that there might be times when I'd have to do that. Um, having said that, I appreciate that it can be really, really hard to talk about this stuff. I'm used to talking about it because I've had it for so long and I've had a lot of treatment and I'm used to being open about it. But for a lot of people who come into medical school with especially problems like depression and anxiety, which are so prevalent uh, in the community of medical students because we're all high achievers and we don't cut ourselves any slack. Um, if you're not used to talking about it and you'd hold yourself to really high standards, then yeah, medical school can be incredibly tough. And so if it's not something you've had support for in the past, I cannot advise you strongly enough to get some support before you start medical school and to make sure you've got support when you're here. Because honestly, it's just the same as any other problem. Like, sometimes my wrists don't work and sometimes my brain doesn't work. That's just how I am. You know, I've done everything that I can do. I'm very proactive in managing it, but sometimes it's beyond my control and there's nothing I can do about it. And actually the number of times that that happens is very small. The impact it has on my education is minimal. And so there's no reason why I wouldn't want the medical school to know about it. In some ways, the positive thing that's come from that is that I'm really alert to burnout. Burnout is something that all of us are really susceptible to. Anyone who's in a high achieving profession where you have to get really high grades academically and you have to put in long hours, I know what my limits are now. And so I know when I'm working too hard and I will stop. And I'm quite comfortable if anyone were to challenge me, they haven't, but if they were to challenge me and be like, why aren't you working past 9 p.m. every night? I can say, well, I'll burn out if I do that. And then I'm no use to anyone. And that can take quite a lot of courage. And if I hadn't had 
all the issues that I've had and therefore all the intervention that I've had, I don't know that I would have the self-awareness to be competent enough to be like, no, if I work more than 12 hours a day, I'm going to burn out. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to get in touch and ask me any questions about the stuff that I've talked about, my email will be on the screen now. I'm sure that Ollie will put it there. Um, and good luck if you're applying to medicine. I really hope you get where you want to go. Bon courage, as they say. I'll see you all later.